Uh, Alan was kind enough to let me usurp him so that I could introduce uh, one of the most outstanding officers I've ever worked for, with, for, also. Um, General Les Lyles has, uh, as he says, failed at retirement many times now. Uh, I worked with him when he was Vice Chief of Staff and we worked to get the RD-180 engines through the government together. And uh, it was an honor to, to serve with him. Uh, he's been the, um, the Air Force Vice Chief of Staff, Chief Technology Officer, Ballistic Missile Officer, so many different things in DOD. But after that, he continued to give back to our industry. He was with USAA Forever just recently, uh, stepped down and provided great guidance to, I'm retired military, so to our troops and, and, uh, and their families. He is on our NASA, NASA Advisory Council. He is a tremendous uh, resource of advice to the Administrator Jim Bridenstein. He is also on the Users Advisory Group and provides tremendous advice as well to the Vice President and the Executive Secretary of the National Space Council, Scott Pace. He is a incredibly trusted advisor to all of us. He sees across all the spectrums. He's a tremendous strategic thinker and uh, we're just blessed to have him in our industry and still still asking the right questions and making sure that we're on the right course. So, General Lyles, I just want an opportunity to thank you for everything you do for NASA and for, for the military. Okay, I should quit while I'm ahead here and just stop right there. Uh, Janet, thank you very much. It's very kind of you, and uh, uh, you know, all of us know how much we value you and the things you've done. And you're both of your Air Force career, uh, your industry career, and particularly what you're doing for NASA as the Chief of Staff. So thank you very much, and, and God bless you. Uh, I just checked and uh, told Janet that I've been trying to reach her for uh, the last uh, couple of weeks or so, uh, not just on NASA or UAG or NASA Advisory Council stuff. I was worried because I know you live in Florida, and I literally, all the times that Durian was either heading towards Alabama or heading towards Florida, I'm not sure which, uh, all the time that was happening, I thought about you being down in, you know, I probably shouldn't have said that, but I should have been <laughs> Oh, good, good, good. Well, uh, first, uh, good morning, everybody, and uh, it's an honor to be here. I can't tell you how much, uh, how much time I've spent in Huntsville over the years, uh, not so much uh, recently, so uh, it's a pleasure to be back here. This first time I've been at this particular facility, uh, I've heard a lot about it from uh, friends like uh, Rebecca Griffin and, and uh, Mike Griffin, uh, who have been mainstays here in the Huntsville area for so many, many years, and Mike, of course, is one of my many mentors and somebody that I really value, and so has, has, uh, has Becky been. So it's great to be here and great to be part of this. And what I'm going to do is talk uh, very quickly about the National Space Council and the User Advisory Group of the National Space Council. And I'm open for questions from anybody. Uh, at the end of this, hopefully we'll be able to uh, at least stimulate some questions or comments from anybody, and I will actually give you an offer in uh, my, uh, my last chart. Uh, I am a member of the user advisory group. We have uh, one other member of uh, the advisory group, Mary Lynn Dittmar, uh, is here. Uh, I also, as Janet mentioned, I chair the NASA Advisory Council, and we have one of the members of the NASA Advisory Council here, Wayne Hale. So uh, we sort of got you surrounded in some respects here in terms of space activity that we're all very, very vested in and very, very interested in. Uh, very quickly, let me see if I can make sure I can get this to work. Now you would think as an engineer, I'd figure this out. Ah, there it is. It's a little green button that has an arrow on it. That's so, so simple. Engineers don't think that way, so, okay. Um, uh, the National Space Council, let me start with the National Space Council. Most of you, uh, probably all of you have heard of the Space Council. Many of you have probably interfaced with the Space Council, and many of you have probably interfaced uh, in the past. Uh, it's a body that's chaired by the Vice President, uh, Vice President uh, Pence, and it consists, the council itself, of several of the key cabinet uh, officials, act, the actual cabinet leaders themselves. Uh, as I think of the major cabinet uh, uh, positions, about the only one that's not really represented on the Space Council that I think is going to change, particularly after the last Space Council meeting, is the Department of Energy. And yet there was a major presentation about nuclear and nuclear power uh, by uh, Dan Brule, the deputy Secretary of DOA, Dan happens to be a friend of, uh, of close friend of mine. And so I know they want to be part of the Space Council and I'm pretty sure uh, the Vice President and the President are gonna agree with that. So that will probably change uh, in the future. Some of you know that 
the Space Council itself has existed at least three different times. Uh, it is on the books, on the law, if you will, to have a uh, National Space Council in the United States advising the President and the Administration uh, and others on space policy, space directives, space activities, uh, and unifying, bringing together all the space activities that exist uh, in dif different agencies of the United States government. However, uh, in every case, the Space Council reported to a particular individual, usually the Vice President of the United States. And I don't think there's anything wrong in just stating that past VPs uh, have not put the same sort of emphasis on the Space Council, so it's wax and wane over the years. It existed from 58 to 73, uh, and then it's sort of, in that particular administration, uh, lost a little interest. It still exists on the books, but uh, there were no meetings, no real activities at all. It existed from 89 to 93, uh, again, uh, very active from the, uh, the Vice President, I think it was Vice President Quayle at the time, uh, and, and others. Uh, but then it sort of died out after that. And then it was reestablished by uh, President Trump and Vice President uh, Pence in June of uh, 2017. Its objective is, as you see up there, to coordinate uh, the U.S. national space policy across all the relevant agencies. And you see the normal ones mentioned up there, uh, civil, commercial, uh, national security, international, et cetera. Probably what goes uh, unsaid, uh, when it says national security, it's usually not stated. That includes intel space, the intelligence community, which are part, uh, for the most part, of the DOD activities and obviously part of national security, but it, it doesn't really state that directly, so I wanted to, to mention that. The bottom line is to strengthen U.S. leadership in, uh, in space. Uh, we've met, uh, or the Space Council has met six times uh, since its uh, existence, and um, the 2019 meetings you see there are listed, uh, one of which was very, very important because it was down here at the U.S. Space and Rocket Center here in Huntsville, and it was at that particular forum that Vice President Pence announced to everybody that we're going back to the moon by 2024. Uh, NASA has had on the books as part of lunar exploration of going to the, to the moon, back to the moon, with a time frame roughly around 2028. The administration, for lots of reasons, lots of valid reasons and, and concerns about trying to get the job done, if you will, um, and really to make sure our competitive edge in the United States doesn't wane, uh, moved the, the ending up, and it's now uh, 2024, and that's obviously what we're all working towards. Uh, there was a last meeting of the council last month, in August uh, at the Uvar Hazi Center. Lots of things discussed about relevant, relevant uh, space activities uh, that have not been addressed. Various entities uh, uh, from other agencies talked, and that's where the Department of Energy uh, expressed their interest in all the things that are going on in the nuclear realm. There have been, since three up there, four uh, space policy directives that have emanated since out of this administration, since the new National Space Council. Uh, the first one, SPD-1, as we referred to it, is to really call to arms, if you will, for US, a U.S.-led integrated program with commercial partners to return humans to the moon uh, with, obviously, Mars as the key objective, and Mars and beyond, a key objective for our space exploration. SPD-2 uh, calls for regulation reform, regulatory, regulatory and policy reform um, for commercial launch and reentry particularly to make sure that barriers, any barriers, anything that's out there that precludes industry, mom and pop shops, uh, big organizations, international uh, players and partners to, to really be a strong participants. And there are lots of regulations, lots of policies. I probably don't need to say that to any one of you. Each one of you could probably quote uh, a bunch of different policies or, or regulations that impact your ability to, to get the job done or to be part of the team. So SBD2 was a charge from the, the Vice President uh, and the Space Council to attack those, to one, identify them, uh, raise what needs to be done at the right and appropriate level so that we can remove those barriers from, uh, barriers from entry into our space activities. Uh, XPD3 uh, is the development of a, a national space traffic management policy to preserve uh, space environment for future use. Uh, lots of activities have been going on there but it's nice to have a formal space policy directive telling us of all the things that need to be addressed in uh, that particular realm. And by the way, each one of us in the user advisory group that I will talk to later 
uh, have some specific role relative to different parts of the uh, SPDs. Uh, SPD 4, not listed there, was the one coming out of the uh, Space Council that really establishes a space force for the United States. Now, uh, we all know, for those who are involved in that, uh, how that's finally uh, defined and what's uh, going to be the final structure is still in work. Uh, DOD, Air Force, and other services have put in their recommendations. The Congress is deliberating to literally now, if you will, between the House and the Senate, the various committees, if you will, as to what the final structure will be for Space Force, but we are going to have one, whether it's called a Space Force under the United States Air Force, whether it's called a Space Corps, uh, like the Marine Corps is under the Navy. Uh, that's what's going to be, uh, de be done for our country with the eventual Go of having a separate six service called a United States uh, Space Force. And so SBD 4 directs that. And then um, their directors to return US astronauts. Oh, did I do that? Did I go backwards? I didn't touch anything, so. Paid announcement, I'm sure they do that about every five minutes here in, in this auditorium. Is there any way we can get back to the charts? Okay, they're working it upstairs. Well, uh, at about the same time that um, the Space Council uh, came to being, there was certainly a recognition that there needed to be some advisory group representative of all the stakeholders, or key stakeholders, to the, the Space Council. Um, the Users Advisory Group, or UAG, uh, as you call it, was established. Uh, it is a Federal Advisory Committee organization, so it's governed by the Federal Advisory Committee Act. I understand that uh, Admiral Jim Ellis, who's one of the members of the UAG, uh, I'll point out a picture of all the UAG members here shortly, uh, it was here yesterday along with Wayne Hale and George Neal and others uh, talking about FACA, uh, the challenges with FACA, the opportunities with FACA, uh, and what the FACA rules dictate in terms of how we deliberate. The primary rule is that we're not allowed uh, to do anything without open presence, if you will, at availability and transparency to the public about the things that we're, uh, we're supposed to be doing. The charter for the UAG was signed in December of 2017. Uh, it says runs for two years. In all honesty, the charter was signed, but we didn't really get running uh, until shortly after that. So while it sounds like uh, this December, our charter runs out, we're in the process of updating that, if you will, to make it realistic. And Janet Karika is heavily involved in that at uh, NASA because the charter is signed by uh, the administrator of NASA, Jim, uh, Jim Bridenstine. Uh, it's intended to be both industry and uh, uh, non-federal uh, stakeholders, if you will, large corporations, smaller corporations. Uh, I dare say the group that we have today is about 30 people. Uh, it was originally 30. One person dropped out at the beginning, so formally it's 29. Uh, but that's flexible. There will be additional members added to the UAG uh, in subsequent meetings. And we're tasked with advising the Space Council on any and all space policy issues relevant to those stakeholders or, I dare say, relative to the nation. Uh, we're supposed to meet three or four times annually. Uh, we've held meetings a couple of times this year. Our next meeting is going to be coming up uh, this, uh, this month, and excuse me, next month. And um, uh, we're busy working again with both the, the uh, NASA Administrator's Office, uh, particularly through Janet, uh, and also the White House to establish uh, exactly what should be the charter for the organization and how should we do our job. Uh, I don't mind saying in this particular forum, uh, we want to make sure that we're value added and that we're not just people with a title of user advisory group and we're not really adding value to NASA, uh, to the leadership, uh, and to the nation. And so uh, there's some things that we think need to be addressed in the charter. Uh, that we're currently working on. And to date, uh, certainly NASA has agreed with them. Uh, the White House staff, uh, through Scott Pace, have agreed with them. We're trying to finalize that so we can get a revised, uh, revised charter. Okay, this is our motley crew, if you will, uh, except for the two people in the middle. The, I won't, <laughs> the uh, uh, group of the user advisor group, we met with the president uh, in the White House in uh, June of last year. Uh, I won't point out everybody there. You probably recognize a key few key people. Uh, the, the guy on the left, of course, is uh, Dennis Molenberg, of, uh, the CEO of Boeing. 
Uh, there's Mary, Mary Lynn standing in front of him. Uh, and standing to her, her left is Buzz Aldrin, who's a, a member. Uh, standing next to Buzz is uh, Jack Smith. I think it's so real uh, appropriate, and I just sort of get a thrill, uh, that the second man on the moon and the next to the last man on the moon uh, are part of this particular advisory group. Uh, your own governor, Governor Kay Ivey, is uh, a member. Uh, she's standing uh, besides Marilyn uh, Henson of uh, Houston of uh, Lockheed Martin. Uh, and then a few others, including astronaut Eileen Collins, uh, representatives from Sierra Nevada Corporation, from uh, Northrop Grumman, uh, Gwen Shotwell's in the back there from SpaceX, um, uh, you name it. We try to get a pretty good representation uh, of uh, stakeholders in the group. Now, uh, I particularly am on this group because I chair, again, the NASA Advisory Council. And having a link between the Advisory Council, NASA, uh, and this group we thought was an appropriate thing to do. So uh, there are a couple of people missing, but uh, that is the, the user uh, advisor group. And I dare say a uh, very esteemed group of individuals. Minus one, I don't count myself in that group, but a very esteemed group of, of individuals. Uh, the charter objectives and scope, uh, I think I've touched on most of these things, what our uh, objectives are and the scope of our, our activities. Uh, we're there to really help. Uh, in every aspect, our space exploration activities and space endeavors for, uh, for, the, for the United States, both human and robotic, uh, scientific. Uh, lots of concerns expressed that science and space science might suffer with all the emphasis on human exploration. That's certainly something that uh, we're also very concerned about and we'll be watching very, very closely and are working diligently with, uh, with NASA and to some extent with partnering with the NASA uh, Advisory Council. One other thing that uh, hasn't really been stated too much in any of our meetings, uh, either for the UAG or for the Space Council, if you read the chart and read the words, it includes the title aeronautics and aeronautical. Uh, and so there are elements of aeronautics and uh, aeronautical activities that we have yet to begin to really look at in the user advisory group. And I just had somebody I just happened to run into at the airport yesterday who's a, a former CEO of MITRE. Uh, and we're pointing out all the concerns that are going on, as George Neal knows particularly, uh, in our, our nation because of the 737 MAX issue and what impact that's having on aeronautics writ large. Uh, and that's something I think that this group also probably needs to put some attention to. So we'll be addressing that to the Vice President to make sure he agrees that we might do some things in that particular area also. Uh, description of duties, I really covered most of the, the things there, so I won't uh, uh, belabor that uh, uh, at all. You can just take a quick glance uh, at them. And here's how we're constructed. We decided to divide ourselves up into subcommittees uh, to focus on key areas, if you will, that are part of our charter, part of our duties. Uh, exploration and discovery, uh, that particular subcommittee I chair, uh, the focus really is on almost everything that uh, we're doing in the exploration realm. Uh, Artemis, uh, the current program, uh, the return to the moon, uh, particularly the accelerator program at, uh, of doing it by 2024. Uh, I will tell you a couple of the tasks that each one of us are, are looking at. One of the tasks that my subcommittee got from, um, uh, from the vice president and from that office is to take an independent look from the UAG at NASA's architecture for the return, uh, return to the moon in 2024. Uh, we want to make sure that the experts that we have uh, on the UAG and where we may have to bring in some uh, outside advice or help, uh, that we are very comfortable with how NASA has approached it, how, what assumptions they've made, what alternatives they looked at, what options, what risk, and what considerations went into defining what the current architecture is. Now, uh, I will tell you, uh, I'm a little guilty to some extent because I happen to chair the, uh, the NAC, the NASA Advisory Council, and the uh, HEO committee or, uh, within the NAC, which is chaired by Wayne Hale uh, and previously by Ken Bowersox, have looked at this subject in depth over the last couple of years. And so I have great confidence that what we're going to see from uh, Marshall Smith and Ken Bowersox and others uh, are going to really provide the answers to the questions that I think the NAC members, excuse me, UAG members legitimately have. But I would work with Janet to try to get that scheduled as quickly as possible so we can get everybody in the same comfort level that I currently have uh, about that. Uh, there's a national security 
uh, subcommittee that Admiral Jim Ellis chairs. I'm so working with him on that. Uh, the challenge we have there in that subcommittee is that there aren't too many of us in the UAG who have all the right tickets, uh, clearances, uh, to delve into everything associated with national security and intel space. Uh, the key focus that we've been asked by the Vice President as a UAG is to opine, if you will, on how the DOD is structuring and organizing the Space Force, or responding to the Space Force. So we've had one meeting with Marilyn Henson, uh, Houston, uh, uh, Jim, and myself, uh, meeting with uh, the DOD individuals talking about their current plans and uh, architectures for the, the Space Force. We have more that we will be doing, uh, but that's the uh, primary task for that particular, uh, particular subcommittee. Uh, economic development, uh, an industrial base, Marilyn Dittmar and Eric Stalmer are chairing that, and they have a wealth of things, including uh, the, a couple of things I mentioned earlier about looking at uh, uh, space, um, uh, I can't think of the right word. Mer hmm? Spectrum, yeah, that's the word I was trying to think of. Sp spectrum issues and lots and lots of things uh, in that particular realm. They've been working this for some time. And so I feel, and Mary Lynn is certainly the right individual to be chairing that particular activity. Astronaut, former astronaut, uh, retired current Army, uh, Army, Air Force Colonel Pam Melroy is looking at technology and innovation uh, and making sure that the innovation and opportunities for innovative ideas and technology are being addressed uh, in all the things that are being looked at for our, our space endeavors. Uh, astronaut, former astronaut, uh, Air Force Colonel Eileen Collins is looking at outreach and education. Uh, how are we doing? How is NASA doing? How's the nation doing? And both uh, outreach to the communities, um, the general community, the public, uh, education opportunities that go along with the new space programs, how are we doing in that particular realm? And I know uh, Eileen has been very, very busy aggressively working that. And then astronaut uh, Dr. Dave Wolf is looking at space policy and international engagement. And again, an area that's uh, uh, just, it's a target-rich environment, if I can use that term, lots of things that are going on in that realm. So we are busy working each one of those particular uh, areas and uh, uh, the different subcommittees. Uh, we will, each one of us in some form, some form or another, provide uh, guidance, a recommendation, written report, if you will, uh, back to the Vice President and the Space Council, and uh, in some cases, uh, uh, key recommendations that we think somebody needs to act upon. Uh, one I'll give you as an example, in the area of policy and regulations, uh, that again, that's just part of SBD2. That's also something that in the NASA Advisory Council, um, Jim Bridenstine had asked me uh, over a year ago to establish a new committee of the NASA Advisory Council that looks at regulatory and policy issues. Uh, Mike Gold, who uh, many of you know, uh, has worked that uh, very, very diligently. And uh, one of the challenges we have uh, and I call it an opportunity, is to take advantage of all the work that Mike and his team are doing for the NAC uh, make sure it's shared with and fed to the, uh, the UAG and the Space Council so we can sometimes either double team, if you will, any uh, regulatory opportunities and policy opportunities we have to, uh, to address those things, whether it's to Congress or in some cases, there's some things and regulations that we feel very comfortable we can just address to the Vice President in his hat as the chair of the, the National Space Council and hopefully get agreement to remove them right away. That's part of one of the objectives that we have. So we're all busy uh, as we can be in this particular area. So let me wrap up there. Uh, as I stated earlier, we have a, a charter revision that we're undergoing now uh, uh, to sort of fine tune, if you will, and put a sharper point on what the UAG does and how we do it particularly. But we recognize that our task really is to represent the stakeholders. And I, to me, the stakeholders are not just industry. Uh, they're not just mom and pop shops or small businesses or big businesses. The stakeholders are the American public. And so we really do want to hear from you uh, on things that uh, uh, we should be focusing on or you think that we need to do the prime to pump, uh, new partnerships that we should consider. Uh, there are any number of companies, if you will, who have come to me and said they really think that they should be part of the uh, user advisor group, and we will be rec making recommendations back to the White House in that regard. So with that, I'll just leave a quote from Stephen Hawkins, and I will wrap up here and be welcome if there's time for any questions.
I always love this period where you ask questions. And uh, I, I used to tell people in the Air Force whenever I did that with a large audience, I'm too ugly for people to stare at for a long time. So ask a question so that I can get out of the way. <laughs> Um, General Lyles, can you share with them how uh, how you feel the process has been working through um, Scott Pace's executive secretary and to the vice president, how engaged you feel that they've been in going back and forth with you and how much uh, you feel they have uh, advocacy for what you're doing? Uh, great question, Janet. And it's, uh, it's an area that, uh, again, I believe in full transparency and being very open. Uh, with forums like this. It's an area that was an initial challenge. And the challenge wasn't because of the fault of anybody. It was because of how busy everybody is. And so Jim, uh, Jim Ellis um, had talked to Scott about more regular interaction between at least Jim as the chair of the UAG uh, and Scott, because Scott has a year of the vice president. And we, at, at times, we weren't sure uh, where the White House wanted us to go in different areas. And so we needed to have... Uh, uh, regular feedback, more regular feedback between us and uh, us to UAG uh, and the, uh, the National Space Council office represented by Scott in, in the White House. We agreed to that. The new charter is actually going to point that out and sort of codify that, if you will. And so I anticipate that in the future, uh, there will be a lot better and a lot more interaction between the UAG uh, itself and things that are coming out of the White House. We know uh, we've had a couple of meetings directly with the Vice President. Uh, it, it was limited, if you will. I think Mary Lynn, myself, Jim Ellis, and uh, one or two others were there with the Vice President in, in February. It happened to be a snow day in D.C. where everybody else was closed, but we were there uh, meeting with the uh, uh, Vice President. We don't think, uh, it's probably uh, naive to think we'll have that kind of interaction, but Scott, as you know, does an excellent job, and we've now codified the relationship to have closer communication between us. All right, over here. Uh, General Lyles, good morning. Frank Slazer with uh, Aerojet Rocketdyne. Yesterday there was a panel on the workforce, and this is something I've not seen the Space Council focus too much on just yet, but one of the constraints, I think, especially as we keep moving forward with advances in both NASA's budget and, and programs as well as on the DOD side, is that we're going to run into a constraint with either technical workers to work in the shop floor or STEM-educated graduates to be able to do the engineering jobs and the technical missions for the, for the organizations. Uh, any thought on that? Is it something that we might see more activity on relative to the, the pipeline of, of people coming into the profession? Yeah, as you know, Frank, every, we think we all know that's a big problem for all of us in uh, technology, to, to, uh, regardless of which field you're in, regardless of which agency you're dealing with. It is something that uh, the, the NAC looks at. We actually have a uh, committee within the NASA Advisory Council that looks at that particular subject with recommendations in terms of education, outreach, et cetera, on the part of NASA and other agencies working in support of NASA, if you will. Um, the Space Council, uh, I mentioned education and outreach that Eileen Collins chairs. Uh, her initial focus was just going to be on outreach. It became very obvious because of exactly that problem you just defined, that the education needs uh, and the workforce needs of the future, uh, if we're going to take on and really be serious about space exploration, uh, including Mars and beyond, it has to be addressed. And so uh, Eileen has taken that uh, particular additional task on within her focus, her subcommittee of the UAG, to report back to uh, the Space Council, if you will, of things that we think need to be done uh, in more earnest and, and more aggressively. And then when I mentioned earlier about participation on the, uh, the National Space Council, uh, one other agency that's not on the Space Council, at least I don't think it has been, but it's critical to this, and we have pointed that out, is the Department of Education. And so I think uh, uh, you're gonna see that folded into uh, the Space Council, which will give certainly more clout and cl uh, credence to addressing that problem writ large. Okay, okay. Thank, thank you, General Lyles. Let's all give, uh, give him a great hand. Thank, thank you. you.